I think will be about more operationally, more detail about what involvement the UK military had uh, in, in intercepting uh, a number of, of missiles and drones being fired uh, into Israel from Iran. And he'll give more detail about the military operation that the UK was involved in. And, and I think the third thing will be this wider narrative that the Prime Minister will want to get across about the way in which Russia is back in Iran, the way in which Russia is still at war in Ukraine, and talk about wider destabilisation uh, around the world and the need for allies uh, to stand together. And I also think we might get an update. There's an expectation David Cameron uh, could be going to the Middle East imminently, so we might hear about that. OK, uh, and Beth, of course, there is... Uh... Seemingly support on the opposition bench as well. We heard from John Healy earlier saying that, you know, it was quite right that the UK had taken this action over the weekend without consulting Parliament. But is that going to be something, do you think, continue? Should there be another attack and British jets carry on shooting down Iranian missiles? Well, there was a conversation about the legality uh, of this, but the government has pointed out that this was an extension of an operation that's already been sanctioned about combating Daesh uh, in the Middle East and that these jets were redeployed, if you like, uh, to deal with uh, the Iranian attacks on Israel with allies. Uh, there is not much opposition in the Commons uh, to the UK action, um, there's a question about whether or not there will be further involvement, which I'm sure the Prime Minister will be asked about. I think the other thing to watch for in this statement is what do his own backbenchers say uh, when they talk about lifting uh, military defence spending? You've seen a number of former ministers, including James Heapy, who spoke to our colleague Deborah Haynes uh, in recent days, calling on the UK to lift defence spending from 2% to 2.5% of GDP, to lift that to 3% of GDP by 2030. Uh, Keir Starmer also talking about uh, lifting defence spending in the face of growing global threats. So I think there could be a discussion in the Commons around that too. And I, and I guess what happened over the week, weekend and the UK's involvement speaks to that, so despite the fact, as, as we know, and as you, of course, have reported, Beth, the, the small size of the UK armed forces at the moment, when these situations do happen, the, the UK does often play a role. It may be a small role, but a role nonetheless. So those that want to see that defence spending increase have uh, got some support in the actions that were seen over the weekend. Yeah, and there is increased discussion as well about the way in which uh, military support to Israel, uh, the US again, uh, pressing or Biden pressing, President Biden pressing for more uh, military spend uh, or assistance to Israel. What's the knock-on effect uh, for Ukraine and, and funding for Ukraine? And, and when uh, allies are facing threats on multiple fronts, uh, do they need to increase spending? And that seems to be the settling view within the Conservative Party. And I wonder how many questions the Prime Minister uh, might get on that today. But also, he will likely stress the way in which uh, the UK really were coming in in support of the US. So uh, RAF jets intercepting uh, drones uh, and backing up uh, US uh, fighter jets uh, in uh, stopping this attack. Um, only 99% of those drones uh, were diverted or stopped from attacking Israel. And the Prime Minister's spokesperson saying to us earlier today that you cannot overestimate what the impact could have been if that attack had been uh, successful from Iran on the wider destabilisation in the region. And I think we'll hear the Prime Minister uh, talking about that as well. Yeah. And, of course, I guess it's worth uh, remembering as well, Beth, that this will be the Prime Minister talking about this situation and the actions of UK jets uh, in the Middle East over the weekend. But it's not long ago that he was also talking about the actions of UK jets in regards to attacks coming from the Houthis in Yemen. For the Prime Minister himself, having to sort of deal with these various threats, uh, it's a, a question as to, to how 
his leadership is seen, I, I presume. It is. I mean, interesting what, you know, what you're referring to about the attacks um, by the Houthis on, on shipping cargo and the way in which the US and the UK have come together to uh, take out uh, Houthi um, targets. Um, the Prime Minister's spokespersons was actually asked this morning, does the UK consider itself to be at war with Iran? And the answer was emphatically no, uh, that this support, uh, this military support over the weekend was all about the collective defence of Israel. And certainly when you listen to the diplomatic language around this, you will not find anyone within government that in any way wants to escalate this. All yeah. the talk has been about de-escalation from Lord Cameron uh, this morning doing the broadcast round. Quite rare for him to do that, but the Foreign Secretary uh, doing the broadcast round this morning with the message echoed uh, by echoing uh, President Biden, you know, take the win, Israel, uh, do not retaliate. retaliate. We don't want escalation. I think he's on his feet. Let's listen in. I'd like to express my deepest sympathy, and I'm sure that of the whole house, on the death of your father. He, he was a true giant, not just of this house, but of the other place too. I also want to express my solidarity with our Australian friends after the horrific and senseless attacks in Sydney in recent days. Our thoughts are with all those affected. Mr Speaker, on Saturday evening, Iran sought to plunge the Middle East into a new crisis. They launched a barrage of missiles and attack drones over Iraq and Jordan and towards Israel. The scale of the attack and the fact that it was targeted directly at Israel are without precedent. It was a reckless and dangerous escalation. If it had succeeded, the fallout for regional security and the toll on Israeli citizens would have been catastrophic. But, Mr Speaker, it did not succeed. In support of Israel's own defensive action, the United Kingdom joined a US-led international effort, along with France and partners in the region, which intercepted almost all of the missiles, saving lives in Israel and its neighbours. We sent additional RAF typhoons to the region as part of our existing operations against Daesh in Iraq and Syria. And I can confirm our forces destroyed a number of Iranian drones. We also provided important intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance support for our partners. Mr Speaker, our pilots put themselves in harm's way to protect the innocent and preserve peace and stability. I spoke to the RAF earlier today. They are the best of the best, and I know the whole House will join me in expressing our gratitude. Mr Speaker, with this attack, Iran has once again shown its true colours. They are intent on sowing chaos in their own backyard, on further destabilising the Middle East. Our aim is to support stability and security, because it is right for the region and because, although the Middle East is thousands of miles away, it has a direct effect on our security and prosperity at home. So we are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We want to see calmer heads prevail and we are directing all our diplomatic efforts to that end. Yesterday, I spoke to my fellow G7 leaders. We are united in our condemnation of this attack. We discussed further potential diplomatic measures, which we will be working together to coordinate in the coming days. I will also shortly be speaking to Prime Minister Netanyahu to express our solidarity with Israel in the face of this attack and to discuss how we can prevent further escalation. All sides must show restraint. Mr Speaker, our action reflects our wider strategy in the Middle East, which I have set out in this House previously. I believe there are three vital steps to put the region onto a better path. First, we must uphold regional security against hostile actors, including in the Red Sea, and we must ensure Israel's security. That is non-negotiable. It is a fundamental condition for peace in the region. In the face of threats like we saw this weekend, Israel has our full support. Second, we must invest more deeply in the two-state solution. That is what we have been doing over the past six months, including working closely with the Palestinian Authority, so that when the time comes, 
they can provide more effective governance for Gaza and the West Bank. Mr Speaker, it is significant that other regional partners actually help to prevent a much worse attack over the weekend. It reminds us how important the attempts to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours really are, and it holds out precious hope for the region. Third, Mr Speaker, the conflict in Gaza must end. Hamas, which is backed by Iran, started this war. They wanted not just to kill and murder, but to destabilise the whole region. This weekend, they rejected the latest hostage deal, which offered a road to a ceasefire. It is Israel's right, and indeed its duty, to defeat the threat from Hamas terrorists and defend its security. And I want to be clear, nothing that has happened over the last 48 hours affects our position on Gaza. The appalling toll on civilians continues to grow. The hunger, the desperation, the loss of life on an awful scale. The whole country wants to see an end to the bloodshed and to see more humanitarian support going in. The, re the recent increase in aid flows is positive, but it is still not enough. We need to see new crossings open for longer to get in vital supplies. And Mr Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the three British aid workers who were killed in Gaza. John Chapman, James Kirby and James Henderson. They were heroes. The children of Gaza, who they were risking their lives to feed, need a humanitarian pause immediately, leading to a long-term sustainable ceasefire. That is the fastest way to get hostages out and aid in, and to stop the fighting. Israelis and Palestinians alike deserve to live in peace, dignity and security, and so do people across the entire region. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, Saturday's attack was the act not of a people, but of a despotic regime. And it is emblematic of the dangers that we face today. The links between such regimes are growing. Tel Aviv was not the only target of Iranian drones on Saturday. Putin was also launching them at Kyiv and Kharkiv. And who was the sole voice speaking up for Iran yesterday, seeking to justify their actions? Russia. The threats to stability are growing, not just in the Middle East, but everywhere. And we are meeting those threats time after time, with British forces at the forefront. It's why our pilots were in action this weekend. It's why they have been policing the skies above Iraq and Syria for a decade. It's why our sailors are defending the freedom of navigation in the Red Sea against the reckless attacks of the Iran-backed Houthi militia. It's why our soldiers are on the ground in Kosovo, Estonia, Poland and more. And it's why we have led the way in backing Ukraine and will continue to back them for as long as it takes. When adversaries like Russia or Iran threaten peace and prosperity, we will always stand in their way, ready to defend our values and our interests, shoulder to shoulder with our friends and our allies. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for advance copy of his statement and for the regular briefings on the developing situation in the Middle East. I also thank the Prime Minister for his warm tribute to your father, Mr Speaker, Doug Hoyle, a great servant of our party, respected by all who knew him. Yeah. I also join the Prime Minister in offering our solidarity with the victims of the horrific attack in Sydney and in recognising the heroism of the three British aid workers killed in Gaza while working for World Kitchen. Turning to the events of this weekend, we support the defensive action taken by the UK over the weekend alongside our international allies against the Iranian attacks on Israel. And we welcome the Prime Minister's call for restraint. Once again, we all salute the professionalism and bravery of our armed forces. We also support the RAF planes being sent to the region to bolster Operation Shader. Their efforts are vital for a safer world. Mr Speaker, there can be no doubt 
that the attack perpetrated by Iranian forces this weekend has left the world a more dangerous place. It targeted innocent civilians with a clear intent to destabilise the region. It must be wholly condemned by all. But, Mr Speaker, let us also be clear. A full-scale conflict in the Middle East is in no one's interest. It is a path that can only lead to more bloodshed, more instability, and the unleashing of forces that are beyond the ability of anyone to control. Mr Speaker, the combined defensive action this weekend was a success, and because of that, lives were saved. As a result, escalation is not inevitable. In repelling the attack, Israel showed strength and courage. It must now show the same strength and courage to de-escalate. That has to be the primary objective. And, Mr Speaker, that is the responsibility of all sides and every partner. We must be resolute and united in our support for the collective security of Israel, Jordan and other partners in the region. But tensions remain very high. We must proceed calmly, carefully and with restraint. Because if diplomacy takes centre stage, and it must, then we also need to be clear diplomatic premises should not be targeted and attacked. That is a point of principle. But as the condemnation from our G7 allies rightly notes, Iran's response this weekend was unprecedented a further step towards the destabilisation of the region and the risk of escalation. And nobody in this House should be or is under any illusion. This is a regime that sponsors terror across the Middle East and beyond, that murders and represses its own people and supports Putin's war efforts in Ukraine. So can the Prime Minister update the House on any new steps he's taking with our international partners to pursue sanctions against the regime? And can he clarify what steps he's taking to limit the power of the Revolutionary Guard to glorify terrorism here in the UK? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, whilst there is no justification for Iran's actions, we cannot be naive to the fact that one of the drivers of tension in the region is the ongoing war in Gaza. Six months on from the horrific Hamas terror attack, hostages remain separated from their families. Thousands of innocent Palestinians have been killed. And now more than a million people face the imminent threat of famine. So I urge the government again to use every ounce of diplomatic leverage that we have to make sure aid to Gaza is unimpeded and drastically scaled up. Alongside that, we reiterate our call for an immediate ceasefire, yep. for Hamas to release hostages, and for a return to a diplomatic process that can rekindle the hope of a two-state solution. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it is right that we condemn Iran's action. It is right that we work with others to defend the security of our allies. And it is right that we seek the end of conflict in Gaza. But this is a moment for restraint, because escalation will only lead to further destruction. And for the sake of all those still caught in the horror and violence, that must be avoided. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the right honourable gentleman for his support of the government's actions. Uh, with regard to what might happen going forward, ultimately Israel has a right to self-defence, as any state does. And the G7 leader spoke yesterday and unequivocally condemned Iran's attack and expressed full solidarity and support to Israel and its people. Uh, but as the Foreign Secretary said this morning, this is a time to be smart as well as tough. Uh, Iran, Israel has successfully repelled, incredibly successfully repelled, the Iranian attack, and Iran is even more isolated on the world stage. And as others have said, we would urge them to take the win at this point. We want to avoid further 
escalation and bloodshed. He's right that it would be deeply destabilising for the region and risks more lives, and all our diplomatics at this point will be geared towards that goal in partnership with our allies. Uh, next, just turning to Iran. Um, as it, the behaviour of the Iranian regime, as I've said previously, including the actions of the IRGC, poses a significant threat to the safety and security of the UK and our allies. And yesterday at the G7, we agreed to work together on further measures to counter the Iranian regime and its proxies. Uh, it was agreed that we should coordinate those actions, and that work is now underway. And obviously, at the appropriate time, either I or ministers will update the House. We have already sanctioned, as he will know, over 400 Iranian individuals, including the IRGC in its entirety. We have a new sanctions regime to enable us to, well, gives us more extensive powers to designate uh, sanctions uh, that we put in place at the end of last year. And of course, the National Security Act, it creates new offences for espionage and foreign interference and means that our security services have the powers that they need to deter, disrupt, and uh, detect threats of a more modern nature from states like Iran. Uh, and lastly, uh, with regard to diplomacy for Israel and the region, we are absolutely committed to a two-state solution and working very hard uh, using all our efforts to bring that about, particularly over the last few months, building up the capability, as I said, of the Palestinian Authority so that they have the technical and administrative capability that is necessary uh, when the moment comes for them to provide effective governments, uh, governance in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. It is absolutely my view and the government's view that Israelis and Palestinians should have the opportunity to live side by side in peace, with security, dignity and opportunity. And I'm proud of the role that the United Kingdom is playing. Yeah, yeah. Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Alicia Cairns. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My condolences on the loss of your father. This remains a very dangerous moment, and yet over the weekend we saw a demonstration of unity and purpose. We saw the depth of will for normalisation and for a secure future for all peoples of the Middle East. Restraint is vital if we want to build on the momentum to get hostages home to their families, to get improvements to continue on aid. But to better protect our people, will my right honourable friend commit to launch a new consensus on Iran with our allies and a new effort with a combined diplomatic, military and wider experts areas to limit the extent of the atrocities of Iran? We need to end the compartmentalisation of the threats when we deal with them. We must deal with them as one, whether it be nuclear ambitions, the arming of the militia, femicide or transnational repression. But only with a new consensus will we see that progress. So will he please commit to leading that internationally? Uh, speak, I, uh, I can give the Honourable Lady that uh, commitment, and that is exactly the subject of our discussions yesterday uh, amongst G7 leaders. And she mentioned nuclear. Iran's nuclear programme has never been more advanced than it is today and threatens international peace and security. Uh, and there is no, absolutely no justification uh, for the, uh, at a civilian level for the enrichment that we are seeing that the IAEA has reported in Iran. And I want to reassure her that we are considering next steps on the nuclear file with our international partners. And we are committed to using all diplomatic tools available to ensure that Iran never develops a nuclear weapon, uh, including using the snapback mechanism if necessary. SNP spokesperson Murray Black. I want to echo the Prime Minister and not only passing on our thoughts to you, Mr Speaker, but also to the families of those aid workers who have been killed in Gaza. Now, I want to begin by condemning the acts of violence by the Iranian regime. These acts are no more than a cynical attempt to exploit the suffering, the pain and the turmoil being experienced by those people in Palestine right now. And whilst we rightly condemn the violent acts of Iran, so too must we condemn the violent acts of Israel. Listening to the interviews that he's been given, the Foreign Secretary is correct in his attempt to uphold the principle of proportionality. But if 100 missiles in retaliation to an isolated attack on an embassy is correctly constitutes as disproportionate, then so too must Israel's 192 days bombardment of Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Now, we know yeah, yeah. that the agenda in Tehran is to bring about as much instability as possible. 
We all have a responsibility to ensure that that does not happen. There is not going to be a military solution to the conflict in the Middle East. There must be a political and diplomatic solution. So what is required now is the same as what was required six months ago. We need de-escalating and the causes of conflict in the region to be reviewed. Now, the biggest continuing cause of conflict is the siege of Gaza, hence the need for a ceasefire. So can the Prime Minister outline what he is doing to ensure that the UN Security Council mandated ceasefire becomes a reality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I think, first of all, it's important not to try and draw any equivalence between Israel's, Israel's absolute right and duty to provide security for its citizens in the face of an appalling terrorist atrocity uh, and, indeed, what happened over the, the weekend. Uh, these things are just not, uh, not remotely the same. So uh, and we will, more broadly, though, as I've said repeatedly from this dispatch box, urge Israel to abide by international humanitarian law. It's been, we've been very clear that too many civilians have been killed and we're deeply concerned about the impact on the civilian population uh, in Gaza and our diplomatic efforts are geared towards alleviating that suffering and I'll continue to raise these points with Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, when I speak to him uh, but as I said drawing equivalence between these two things is absolutely the not right thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The Defence Select Committee, Jeremy Thank you, Speaker. Uh, notwithstanding the sheer scale of the Iranian attack, multi-layered air defence proved Effective. Are we ensuring that any learnings we picked up we're passing on to Ukraine for the use of their own defence? And in a more hostile and dangerous world, and with the ever increasing proliferation of missile and drone technology, are we reviewing our own air defence assets and capabilities to support our allies and indeed closer to home if ever required? Um, well, Mr. Mr Speaker, can I thank my old friend for an excellent question? He's right about the importance of air defence, which is why it has repeatedly been one of the key capabilities that we have sought to provide to Ukraine, uh, something that we have led on uh, for some time, and ditto uh, with some of the new contracts that we've placed most recently this year to replenish UK stockpiles, also um, cover air defence missiles. Uh, he's more broadly right that we need to ensure that our industrial production here in the UK is geared to produce the capabilities that we need, whether it's for our own use or for Ukraine's use. And I'm pleased to say the Defence Secretary is working with the industry to ensure that supply chain is there to meet those needs. Ed David. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I send you and your family our deepest condolences on the loss of your father? And can I associate myself and my colleagues with the comments of others about the appalling murder, murders in Sydney and the death of the aid workers in Gaza? Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Prime Minister for his statement? The Liberal Democrats join him in condemning Iran's attack on Israel. This is an alarming escalation in a conflict that has already seen far too many deaths and suffering. So we support the action taken by the RAF to intercept Iranian drones as we stand up for Israel's security. Mr Speaker, we also worry about what Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government will do next. The Prime Minister rightly says we must prevent further escalation. So does he agree that the best way to achieve that is to press all sides to agree to an immediate bilateral ceasefire in Gaza to get the hostages home, to get the aid in, and put us on the path to a lasting peace for a two-state solution. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we've repeatedly called for an immediate humanitarian <laughs> pause so that we can get the hostages out and more aid in and use that as the foundation to build a more lasting and sustainable ceasefire. But it is worth pointing out, which hasn't been mentioned by colleagues so far, that Hamas have yet again rejected another offer to release hostages, and it's important that we don't lose sight of that. We must have the hostages released as part of any of those conversations, and it was Hamas yet again over the weekend who have rejected the latest round of those talks. Salim Fox. Mr Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend for the leadership he's shown on this issue and echo his call for the need to avoid a spiral of escalation. But we've seen a, a military attack by Iran on a nation which its regime believes should not exist yeah. at all. 
Iran has directly or indirectly engineered a war in Gaza with yeah. the aim of thwarting better relations between Arab states right. and Israel, right. especially Saudi Arabia. We now have death and destruction in Gaza in a conflict that no one can win and where the only beneficiaries are Iran, its proxies and its allies. We've seen an Iranian journalist uh, attacked on British soil and we've seen a, a vessel, an international vessel, being pirated by the IRGC in international waters, another vile example of hostage taking. So I ask my right honourable friend again, why are Iranians still operating out of Heathrow? Why are Iranian banks still operating in the city of London? When will the snapback mechanism be invoked? And what can be done to stop the export of Iranian oil to Russia and other countries, which is now keeping the regime afloat? Yeah. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his leadership on this issue over a consistent period of time, and he's right to highlight the threats that Iran poses to us. I want to reassure him that on all the areas that he mentioned, active work has been undertaken by the government. As I mentioned in my statement, we discussed yesterday on the G7 call the need and benefit of coordinating further measures, perhaps including some of the things that he talked about, amongst allies in order to have maximum impact both on the regime and uh, on the ultimate designations of any future sanctions. I'm pleased that our new sanctions regime that we implemented at the end of last year gives us extensive new powers. I'm keen to make sure we use them to good effect, but where we can coordinate those with allies, I know he'd agree with me that that would be preferable, and I can reassure him that that work is happening at pace. Sir George Hallett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I too pass on my condolences for the loss of your dad, Doug? Uh, I was one of those who, on many occasions, benefited from his wise advice. The, there is no, as the Prime Minister said, there is no moral equivalence between two sides in this, what's happening in Gaza and what happened um, in the attacks from by Iran on Israel. He, it is the case, though, that um, Israel has made mistakes in the past and should be held to account for them. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that, as things move on, the importance of neighbouring states, particularly, uh, for example, Jordan, is going to be vital, not just in resolving the current difficulties, but also uh, in resolving a long-term future which brings about a two-state solution. In a, in a word, yes, I pay tribute to uh, the King of Jordan for the leadership role that he has played over the past several months. Uh, we are fortunate to enjoy a strong working relationship with the Jordanians, which was on display yet again over this weekend, and I commend him and his country for what they've done. Suella Bratham. Mr Speaker, please accept my condolences on the loss of your father. Yeah. Two weeks ago, Mr Speaker, I was in Israel at the northern border with Lebanon. And, of course, we've all seen what happened this weekend. But since October the 7th, Iran-backed Hezbollah has fired over 4,000 rockets into northern Israel, displacing over 150,000 Israeli civilians. I met some of those families. They're under siege. They've been uprooted. But they are brave and defiant in the face of terrorism and anti-Semitism. <coughs> Mr Speaker, we have known for years that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps is the world's chief sponsor mm -hmm of terrorism, here, here. funding and promoting terrorist plots, radicalisation and hostage taking both in the Middle East and at home. Mr Speaker, we have prescribed Hamas, we have prescribed Hezbollah. Prime Minister, why don't we put the UK's why don't we put Prime Minister, why don't we put the UK's national security first by now prescribing the IRGC? Here, here. Uh, Mr Speaker, as the uh, Ronald Ron lady knows that we don't comment on any potential prescription decisions, but of course we recognise the threat from Iran and have taken measures to counter it at home and around the world. I obviously refer her to my previous answer, but I'm confident the police, security services and courts all have the tools that they need to sanction, prosecute and mitigate the threats from Iran. We've strengthened our sanctions regime recently and including sanctioning the IRGC in its entirety. Russia Nara Ali. Speaker, despite the calls for a ceasefire here in our parliament, 
and across the international community, the war in Gaza has raged, costing 33,000 lives, as well as the 1,200 killed by Hamas attacks and a humanitarian catastrophe that is now turning to a famine. For months, many have raised the spectre of the concern around regional escalation. Can the Prime Minister say more about precisely what conversations he is having with the leading figures in the Israeli government, as well as um, through uh, various parties to influence the Iranian regime to de-escalate as quickly as possible, given the seriousness of the crisis? Um, well, both the Defence Secretary and Foreign Secretary have spoken uh, to their counterparts over the weekend, uh, including the Foreign Secretary has spoken to the Iranian Foreign Minister specifically to urge de-escalation and condemn what happened over the weekend. I'm speaking to Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, shortly, and I can reassure her and all members of the House that we will continue, together with our allies, to urge calm heads to prevail and de-escalation. Uh, we think that's the right course forward, and as I said, across all levels of government, that's the message that we were taking to everyone. Yeah. Ben Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is another country uh, that is under almost constant daily bombardment by Iranian made drones. That country is Ukraine. Some three years ago, I asked the Israelis, I pleaded with the Israelis to help Ukraine against Russia, and they refused, even though Russia was spending half a billion dollars in the Iranian drone programme. I know the Prime Minister is speaking to the Prime Minister of Israel later today. Now that RAF pilots have quite rightly gone to the defence of Israel, yeah. could he perhaps ask that Israel now decides that it is time to help Ukraine in their hour of need and we can see off both Russia and Iranian aggression? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, can I thank my honourable friend for the role he's played in ensuring UK security and that of our allies uh, over previous years? He's right, as my statement alluded to. Uh, as well. The Ukrainians are suffering from Iranian drones over the same weekend that this happened. And I'm also pleased not only will I take up his points of always with all our allies, urging them to do more to support Ukraine, I know he will have welcomed the recent announcement a few weeks ago of more support from the, Ukraine, from the UK to Ukraine, specifically in the areas of uncrewed platforms on autonomous warfare to make sure that the Ukrainians both have the ability they need to protect themselves and conduct their operations. Uh, and the majority of the 10,000 new platforms that we are delivering to the Ukrainians uh, were also will have been developed in the UK, which I know is something that he was keen to ensure that we saw the benefits of here at home. I'm glad that has been realised, supporting Ukraine and their security and bolstering the British defence industry here at home. John MacDonald. There's consensus across the House, rightfully so, to call for restraint on the Israeli government. But we've called for restraint before. We call for restraint with regard to the attack on Gaza, yet the indiscriminate bombing took place. We call for restraint on the settlements in the West Bank, and yet the settlements have expanded. We call for a restraint so that food could be gotten to the children of Gaza, and yet malnutrition is killing some of them. So what action will the government take if Israel does not show restraint, because we're in danger of the Middle East being set alight by the decisions taken by the right-wing factions within the Netanyahu cabinet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm sorry. I, I missed the part of the honourable gentleman's question where he condemned Iran and Hamas uh, for what they've done. Uh, but we will always encourage de-escalation in the region, and I'm proud of the role the UK is playing to bring that about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kit Walters. Speaker, the Prime Minister was quite right to authorise the defence of Israel and, the, um, I guess, the avoidance of violence and death. But violence has also erupted in the West Bank, as he will know, over the last few days. What concrete steps can we take to protect those civilians too? Mr Speaker, the issue of settler violence in the West Bank is something that I have personally repeatedly raised with Prime Minister Netanyahu, as indeed have my colleagues, including the Deputy Foreign Minister. And we have joined with allies in sanctioning activity of particular individuals uh, where we, it has been brought to our attention and we will continue to ensure that the Israeli government does everything it can to reduce tensions in the West Bank. We don't think it's conducive to long-term peace in the region and that's why I said we've taken action where we can as well as being very explicit about our concerns with the Israeli government. George Galloway. Mr. Speaker, I knew your father well for a very long time. He was a fine man and I am sincerely sorry for your loss. 
There was not one single word in the Prime Minister's statement of condemnation of the Israeli destruction of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, which is the proximate reason for the event everyone is here in concert condemning. He was not even asked to do so by the front bench opposite. Kay Burley is the only person so far to demand that of a government minister. We have no treaty with Israel, at least not one that Parliament has been shown. And the Iranians are not likely to listen to him when Britain occupied Iran, looted its wealth, and overthrew its one democratic socialist government in my own lifetime. <laughs> Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, what, whatever may have happened uh, a few weeks ago, it is absolutely no justification for launching more than 300 drones and missiles from one sovereign state towards Israel. It's as simple as that. And in the Honourable Gentleman's question, not once did he condemn that action or indeed the actions of Hamas in the region. There is no equivalence between these things whatsoever, and to suggest otherwise is simply wrong. Yeah. Robert Holford. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr Speaker. I thank my right honourable friend for his strong support for the State of Israel. And last year, as Israel and Saudi Arabia were about to strike a transformational agreement, Iran-backed Hamas carried out its massacre on October the 7th with the aim of torpedoing the chance of peace between Israel and the Arab nations. And last Saturday's drone attack by Iran, being thwarted by Israel and her allies, including Jordan, demonstrated that Arab countries can work alongside Israel after this new period of contention. So does my right honourable friend agree that this represents a new opportunity for Israel and the Arab nations to rebuild relations in the aftermath of October 7th and bring the hostages home? Mr Speaker, I agree uh, with my honourable friend. It is significant that other regional partners actually help to prevent a much worse attack over the weekend, and it reminds us how important attempts are to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours. It holds out precious hope for the region. It's exactly that hope that Iran and its proxies are trying to snuff out, and we should work very hard to combat that. John Butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you and your family, Mr Speaker. Um, Prime Minister, I condemn Iran and Hamas. Let me start there. But we must not lose focus on the situation in Gaza, where there is a humanitarian crisis, uh, <coughs> famine, and and it's just destruction that people are seeing in front of their eyes. But if we want to, if we want to ensure that the hostages come home, like the hostage that's been adopted in Brent, Noah Argumenti, we must argue for a ceasefire and not a pause. Will the Prime Minister clearly state that we should be calling for an immediate ceasefire on all sides? Mr Speaker, it's, it's wrong to suggest in any way that we have lost sight of what is happening in Gaza and indeed the G7, G7 statement yesterday referenced specifically at our desire to cooperate to end the crisis in Gaza, working, to, working towards an immediate humanitarian pause where hostages can be released, aid can go in and build the conditions for a sustainable ceasefire and crucially deliver more humanitarian assistance into the region. It's welcome that we have seen an increase in that flow over the past few days and weeks, but far more aid has to get in and that's the pressure that we will continue to put on all partners concerned. Sir Ian Duncan. Mr Speaker, my condolences. <clears throat> Can I commend my right honourable friend's statement? Uh, it's quite clear, as has been said already, that all roads lead back to Tehran when it comes to the terrible violence and the wars that take place uh, in the Middle East. And every country, not just Israel, but other Arab countries, fear what Tehran is doing in their countries as well, the thing we forget about. Can I therefore we'll know that if we know that they are committing murder at home, they've, com they've executed thousands of protesters whilst uh, this war in Hamas has been taking place. So with all of that known, could I please ask my right honourable friend, when he sits down with our international colleagues and looks for other things to take place with regards to restricting Iran, please, please, could he now consider 
prescribing the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps and to do it in a way that makes sure they can no longer ferment extremism here in the United Kingdom as well. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his question. Uh, as I said to him, or I said in the statement, we are urgently working with our allies to see what steps we can take together in a coordinated fashion uh, to deter and condemn what Iran is doing. Uh, with regard to destabilising activity here in the UK, you know, he'll know that the Charities Commission very recently have opened an investigation to a particular organisation, uh, and we will continue to use all the powers at our disposal to make sure that people aren't fermenting hate and undermining British values here at home from abroad. Sarah Sultan. Mr Speaker, I have notified the Office of the Member for Rutland and Melton that I would be referencing her in my question. It was recently revealed that the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee told a private fundraising event, and I quote, the Foreign Office has re received official legal advice that Israel has broken international humanitarian law, but the Government has not announced it. So I have a very simple question for the Prime Minister, and if he can't answer that, if he dodges and if he deflects, our constituents will know that he is hiding the truth. Was the Chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee telling the truth, yes or no? Yeah. 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 Well. Mr Speaker, I'm happy to address this very clearly. We have one of the mo most robust arms export licensing control regimes in the entire world. We have previously assessed that Israel is committed and capable of complying with IHL, but we regularly review our assessment, as she would expect. As the Foreign Secretary confirmed last week, the UK position on export licences is unchanged and following the latest assessment ah. is in line with our legal advice. Ah. We will keep that position under review and act in accordance with advice. And I would also point out to her that actually most like-minded countries have not suspended right. their existing right. arms export licences right. to Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Cop. Uh, Mr Speaker, I too uh, welcome the Prime Minister's uh, leadership in this area. Will he add his thanks uh, in addition to the thanks for the RAF who have uh, undertaken exemplary action this weekend, also those US service personnel who are based here in the United Kingdom, including many in my West Suffolk constituency, who were prepared to act at a moment's notice in order to defend the, uh, the attack on Israel, uh, which has been roundly condemned. Well, I'm happy to join my honourable friend in paying tribute to our colleagues, not just in America, but from partners uh, around the region who participated in a joint international effort. Uh, this was all uh, in support of Israel's own actions, and also their armed forces deserve enormous praise for the success in which they repelled this awful attack. Black. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I pass my condolences to you and your family for the sad loss of your father, Doug? We live in deeply unsettling times, and the Prime Minister is right, along with our allies, to call for a de-escalation. When the Prime Minister has these discussions with Prime Minister Netanyahu this afternoon, can he convey to him that now is the time to step back? There must be no further escalation in the Middle East. And, Mr Speaker, now is the time to recognise that both Israelis and Palestinians must live in peace. And in order to do that, we need that two-state solution. But as the former Prime Minister David Cameron said in 2014, when we had an outbreak of violence in Gaza, he then unequivocally called for a ceasefire. We must now, today, put an end to the conflict and the killing in that region for the benefit of both these countries. And finally, if I may say so, I welcome the comments of the Prime Minister on the situation in Ukraine. But we're all aware of the reports of the build-up of Russian activity. And I ask the Prime Minister, with our allies, that we must do more today to protect our friends in Iran, to give them the tools that they need to be able to defend themselves and to be able to make sure that Russia is defeated. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm happy to say to our honourable uh, gentleman that we remain steadfast in our support for Ukraine and we will not allow Putin to achieve his aim of eradicating freedom and democracy in that country. We have announced significant support. It was the first trip that I made at the beginning of this year and have encouraged allies to do the same. And We are committed to supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes, for not only for them to win the war, but also to emerge as a strong, sovereign and free country. Yeah. Manchester. Thank you. 
Mr Speaker, my thoughts and condolences are with your family. The United Kingdom stands for an international rules-based system respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity of other nations. And that is one of our key objectives with regards to Ukraine. Of course, I condemn in the fullest Iran's attack on Israel. And I have previously condemned Iran's malign behaviour in the region. The question that is on people's mind is this. What information or intelligence does the Prime Minister have with regards to what was going on in Iran's consulate in Damascus, which led to that attack by Iran? Because the international community and people around the world want to see United Kingdom applying international law consistently across the board. Mr Speaker, whatever happened in that situation has not been uh, confirmed, and regardless, there can never be any justification for launching, as I said, over 300 drones and missiles towards Israel from another sovereign country, and it was right that we took action with allies to repel that attack. Richard Burgess. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and my condolences to you on the loss of your father. He'll have been very, very proud of you. This is a very dangerous moment. The UN Secretary General rightly told the Security Council last night, now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Ordinary people in both Israel and Iran, across the whole region, indeed wider world, will pay the price of this escalate. The Secretary General also rightly reiterated the call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, as the Security Council voted for, given the huge loss of life there. This is the first opportunity we've had to question the Prime Minister since the recent killing of British nationals in Gaza. So is the Prime Minister planning to appoint an independent advisor to scrutinise the Israeli inquiry into those deaths of British nationals uh, in a similar way to the way Australia has done? Uh, Mr Speaker, I spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu after that incident to express our very strong concerns about what had happened. We are carefully reviewing the initial findings of Israel's investigations into the killing of the aid workers and welcome the suspension of two officers as a first step. These findings must be published and followed up with an independent review to ensure the utmost transparency and accountability. Can I congratulate the Prime Minister for his strength defending Israel and wider peace in the Middle East? His strength in this area is world leading. Now, our friend, this country's friend Saudi Arabia, has now said in an official statement that Iran, quote, engineered the war in Gaza, end quote, in order to destroy the progress the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was making in normalizing relations with Israel. Now, that very important statement yesterday also said that Iran is a country that sponsors terrorism and it should have been stopped a long time ago. That's the Saudis saying that. So is my right honourable friend as hopeful as I am that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Israel, both allies of this country, will normalise their relations as soon as possible, as it looks like they were on track to do before the pogrom of the 7th of October? Yeah. Well, I had a very constructive meeting uh, in Saudi uh, Arabia um, with MBS at the end of last year, and I know how important it is to normalise relations between Israel and its neighbours. And it's clear from this weekend, and indeed the comments that the Honourable Gentleman just made, that there is momentum and a desire to see that happen. And it holds out, I believe, precious hope for the region. Thank you. Can I also pass our condolences from my party on to you and the loss of your dad? That's the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in the House of Commons after delivering a statement following the UK's involvement in defending Israel from an Iranian missile and drone attack over the weekend, uh, stating once again that the UK must now push for there to be a two-state solution, that the conflict in Gaza must come to an end, and reiterating that Britain supports and will defend Israeli security. Let's bring in our political editor, Beth Rigby, uh, for more on this. She's been listing in as well. Uh, and Beth, those are some of the bullet points that uh, Rishi Sunak uh, made during his statement, some of the uh, important things that he wanted to uh, make clear. What have you made of some of the tone of the discussion that he faced following giving that statement? Well, it, it, it was interesting in that there might have been some expectations for actual substantive announcements. That is not what the Prime Minister did there. What he did was a careful diplomatic dance, if you like. He uh, reiterated support 
for Israel. He said he would be speaking to Netanyahu shortly. I understand that won't be today, but he will be speaking to him. Um, and he also, though, at the same time, called for restraint. He said all sides need to show restraint. He acknowledged actors, regional players, uh, who also uh, took part um, in the... Um, in the um, operations on Saturday night in order to intercept, intercept and bring down uh, some of those uh, projectiles that were being sent into Israel. Uh, and he acknowledged when he was talking about regional partners, the need for a two-state solution and the need to end the war in Gaza. So really a diplomatic statement solely focused, if you like, uh, on what's going on in the Middle East and messages to both regional partners and Israel. In terms of the questions, though, uh, a lot of unhappiness, I would say, on the Conservative benches. Liam Fox talked about more effective sanctions. He's a former Defence Secretary. The Prime Minister uh, said that he was working with G7 partners uh, on that and, and wanted to get uh, collaboration in order to have maximum effect. And then a couple of other uh, MPs talking about uh, how the government should perhaps prescribe the um, Iranian Revolutionary Guard, should they be prescribed as a terrorist organisation, the Prime Minister dodging that. Did indeed. All right, uh, Beth Rigby, appreciate that analysis. Beth Rigby, there, our political editor. Now, if you, uh, viewer, want to continue watching the debate in the Commons, you can do so. You can see it's on the side of the screen there by scanning that QR code that you see there. We're going to have uh, more analysis on that debate. But coming up after the break, it'll be Business Live with Ian Kinger. Thanks for being with us this afternoon.
The top business door is live from the Sky News City studio. Oil prices ease, but concern remains over the impact of rising tensions in the Middle East. Tesla reportedly planning to lay off more than 10% of its global workforce as it battles falling sales. And helping the World Bank do more on climate change, I'll be speaking live to the Vice President of the Rockefeller Foundation. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. Next week sees the annual spring meetings of the World Bank Group and the International Monetary Fund in Washington. There will be particular interest on how the World Bank, which has expanded its mission to include more work on climate, is making progress on that front under its new president, the former MasterCard chairman, Ajay Banga. Well, among those partnering the bank is one of the world's biggest philanthropic organisations, the Rockefeller Foundation. Well, joining me now from Washington is Eric Polofsky. He's the vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, Eric, welcome to you. Before we talk about the spring meetings, um, you've worked across Middle East conflict zones. I I'd love to know your thoughts on, on where this situation goes from here. Hi, Ian. Thanks for having me. Look, I think uh, right now everybody has taken a deep breath and is looking at whether the escalation path that's in front of them is really desirable. And I think most of the countries looking at it will decide that it's not. But I think there's going to need to be some serious persuasion in some cases to make sure that the escalation doesn't get out of hand. I think you could expect at least one more reply, uh, but that has to be carefully calibrated so that it doesn't leap up the escalation chain. I mean, Iran's attack on Israel was obviously well telegraphed and Israel was supported by the US, the UK and France, among others. Could it hold its own against Iran in the event of an all-out war? Well, I, I don't think anybody generally goes anywhere betting against the Israeli military. Uh, but on the other hand, there is uh, an infinite amount of soft belly around the world. And I think that one should not miscalibrate around that. Uh, I think that if you have uh, the Israelis in a direct conflict with Iran, uh, there are real possibilities of collateral and also escalation from other countries none of which uh, would be obviously a good thing. Obviously, you spend a great deal of your time dealing with what one might describe as the global south. I mean, I've, I've seen it suggested that uh, this particular issue has been weaponized to turn the global south against the West, the United States, the United Kingdom, the EU and so on. Is that a cause of concern for you? Well, I think it, it realistically, the, the global south is watching this amongst a million other things. And frankly, they're more focused on their set of problems. Uh, obviously, there are actors in this uh, uh, geopolitical stage that would try to weaponize it. But frankly, I think if you're a, a finance minister who's coming to the World Bank and the IMF meetings here in Washington, you're going to be focused on, on your budget, your fiscal space, your debt burden, uh, the climate uh, challenges that are affecting your economy. I don't. I don't think that the top of their list is the the U.S. Uh, and Israel and Iran or anybody else in a conflict. Uh, so I don't. I don't think that's where their heads heads are at. Now you've been leading the foundation's work on the the so-called Bridgetown agenda. This move to try and cut borrowing costs for for poor countries. What progress is being made on that front? Well, I, actually, the the we're we're part of the support network that uh, Prime Minister Motley, President Ruto, uh, President Akufo Ada are are looking to to be helpful. But they're really leading the charge. We're we're trying to bring the the policy options and the and the support network. But they're the real leaders, and I think they have made considerable progress in first of all focusing the world's attention on what options there are to change. Uh, their reality and our reality, frankly, everything they do affects the, the global north, uh, the emissions that are going into the, the world. Uh, and so I think you look at uh, the balance sheet of the bank, you look at some of the climate resilient debt clauses that have been adopted, uh, you, you've seen considerable progress. But the problem is the magnitude of the crisis on climate and on debt is just not being touched by the, the, the steps that have been taken thus far. There, there are small impacts, they're getting bigger, but they need to be at a different scale of magnitude 
to have a real impact. But nonetheless, would you argue that progress is being made in terms of helping the, the Global South transition away from carbon? Uh, for, and unfortunately, I, I think that the transition is fully focused, but the, the amount of renewables that are going into the developing world are is a minuscule percentage of the renewable uh, uh, energy transition that's taking place globally. Most of that transition is taking place in the OECD countries, in the developed world. And as a result of that, we're really missing the boat because when it comes to it in the next decade, three fourths of the emissions growth is going to be in the developing world. And that problem is not being dealt with. It really has to have a, a considerable focus by the World Bank, the IMF. And of course, folks are, are aware of the problem. The, the 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 solutions just aren't at the scale that that they need to be in order to make a difference. Which are the countries where attention is most pressingly needed? Well, I, I think you've got the high emitters in the middle income, and you've also got uh, uh, all, all of the developing world. So you know, I, I think to try and single out a country where there's you know you're going to make a, a you know a single impact and it's going to be you know silver bullet i don't i don't think there are silver bullets in this case obviously india mexico brazil they all are middle income countries that are making you know their way through the you know the the energy transition uh and they need attention but fact of the matter is low income countries need just as much attention yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned India because, I mean, a lot of people would say, well, hang on, India is sufficiently prosperous to be able to send a rocket to the moon now. Do, do they really need the support of an organisation like the World Bank? Well, I think the... the uh, but the immense challenges that India face are very significant. And I don't think that, that we should just sort of say, you know, you've graduated to the point where we don't need to pay attention to you. And I, I think there is a need for the World Bank to... Uh, and much as these institutions do, walk and chew gum at the same time. And uh, Ian, I'm absolutely convinced that these institutions can do it. They just need, uh, and we've got a real leader like uh, Ajay Banga, but we really do need the institutions to make a, a step change in the way they're, they're affecting this. This is not you know, incremental change. We need paradigm shift in the way these organizations are taking on the problem. All right, Eric, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Do appreciate you spending the time to chat to us today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Some other business news stories for you now. And the price of oil has fallen while equities have risen today, as markets appear to have taken Iran's attack on Israel at the weekend in their stride. While the Israeli war cabinet is undecided on how to respond to Iran's attack, Brent crude, which finished at $90.45 a barrel on Friday evening, has today traded as low as $89.21 a barrel. Well, speaking to me a little earlier, Henry Allen, the macro strategist at Deutsche Bank, outlined dangers to the wider global economy. I think the biggest risk is not just what happens to the oil price, because people are factoring that in to some extent, but the biggest risk is what economists recall second round effects, which is basically where, you know, oil prices go up, for instance, but because firms like supermarkets, for example, you know, use oil, have energy costs, they then start passing those costs on into other goods and services. So actually, what you can see is that you get an oil shock and then other prices start to rise as well, which is how that inflation becomes more broad based, more concerning, the sort of thing that central banks would need to react to. Tesla is to lay off more than 10% of its global workforce, according to an internal memo seen by Reuters. The world's largest car maker by market value employs 140,000 people globally, but it's grappling with falling sales and an intense price war among electric vehicle manufacturers. The memo, reportedly written by the chief executive Elon Musk, said Tesla is looking at every aspect of the company for cost reductions and increasing productivity. Tesla, whose shares have fallen by more than 30% this year, has not caught response responded to the, the reports. The international motor dealer Inchcape has sold its UK retail operations for £346 million to the US motor dealer Group One Automotive. <laughs> the business employs around 3,600 people in more than 80 sites and partners with car makers including Jaguar Land Rover, Volkswagen, Toyota and BMW. Inchcape, which will return £100 million of the sales proceeds to shareholders, said the disposal would leave it focused on distribution. The shares are up by three and a quarter percent. 
The recruitment firm Page Group said today it had continued to reduce the size of its workforce after the slow end it saw to 2023 continued into this year. The company said it had let go 100 fee earners during the first three months of the year, taking the total over the last 12 months to 888. Page Group reported a gross profit of £219.7 million for the first three months of the year. That was down 12.8% on the same period last year. The shares are off by nearly 5%. Now, decarbonising everyday products is seen as a key as playing a key role in mitigating climate change. Itaconix, listed on AIM, seeks to do this by replacing microplastics with plant-based polymers that can be used in products such as hair gel, detergents and deodorants. Well, today the company announced a 40% rise in full-year sales to 7.9 million US dollars, while pre-tax uh, losses fell by 39% to 1.5 million dollars. Well, joining me now is John Shaw. He's co-founder and chief executive of Itaconics. John, welcome to you. Your sales were up 40% during the year. How much of that came from volume and how much from price? Uh, most of that came from volume. Uh, we kept our prices pretty much the same. We've increased our penetration into the cleaning products, uh, beauty and hygiene applications across the board with volume. And that's where you're seeing strongest demand right now, beauty and hygiene. Uh, the, it, that area is growing for us, particularly post-pandemic. There was a, a lull in the pandemic. We see that as a high growth area in the, in the future. It's also a very high margin area for us. Uh, great opportunities for us to bring plant-based ingredients into consumer products. What are the product applications, do you think, where you haven't quite uh, applied the chemistry in a, as much as you would like to? Uh, two big areas for us, first of all, is in leather. Uh, sustainable fashion is growing. Uh, the need to increase plant-based content in leather products. Uh, we think that's a high area of growth for us. And then the next one is right over my shoulder here is in uh, artistic paints. This is our first professionally produced uh, paint uh, using uh, our formulas uh, in, in base, uh, base chemicals in that one. So we, we see those as two big areas for us. And then long term in the future, super absorbers to go into the hygiene products. And in terms of uh, the competitive landscape, John, talk, talk me through that. Who, who are you up against? We're up against a lot of traditional petrochemical-based uh, chemistries and formulations that are out there. Uh, we sell, though, even though we are plant-based, our starting material is a natural metabolite found in our bodies, found in uh, nature that we process into valuable ingredients. Uh, but we're primarily against fossil-based ingredients uh, where we deliver better performance and better cost in certain applications and bring sustainability in. That's what's important to us in terms of decarbonizing is that we are not asking consumers to pay a higher price. There's a lot of sense that we have to, consumers have to pay a high expense for climate change. There's certain market segments where we're doing it with the same, uh, at the same or lower price. And is that message getting through to consumers, do you think? I mean, ultimately, obviously, you're, you're, you're more of a B2B business. Correct, but um, we work with, um, you know, 50 to 100 different brands across uh, North America and Europe. Uh, what they're seeing is the ability of our ingredients uh, to bring uh, valuable claims that consumers like. Um, only a small portion of it really is based on being uh, plant-based. Most of it's around performance side of it. And everyone likes better performance at a lower cost, and that's what we like. Um, I mentioned the uh, competitor landscape just a moment ago, John. What about uh, the, the chemistry that you're utilising? Is anyone else doing that specifically? We have a broad platform, about 16 patent families uh, that protect our platform. Um, I'm actually talking to you from our production facility. This is the only production facility of its like in the world. Uh, so we don't think there's any direct competitor. There are other routes that you can use uh, some fossil-based uh, ingredients to get there. But I think for our our particular um, chemistry, we're it. And how far off are you from being profitable at the pre-tax level, at the sort of headline level? Uh, we're a couple of years away from it. Um, I think uh, we we keep getting uh, keep getting closer and closer. I think the fundraise that we did last year uh, gave us plenty of cash. It's giving a lot more operating room in terms of negotiating better terms and better agreements with our customers so we can get our gross profit margins up. Uh, it's really a great new era of development for us. OK, John, we have to leave it there. Good to talk to you today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
Still to come here on Business Live, we'll take a look at how the markets have finished this afternoon. Stay with us. When you cover big, tense protests, there's almost always a moment when the atmosphere changes, there's a different noise, and you start to smell tear gas in the air. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world. Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt. It can be incredibly surreal being swept up in their world, but we try to give you an honest sense of how these people really are. When we spoke to the fishermen down in Cornwall, all the politics from Westminster was a million miles away. This was about their jobs, their livelihoods. and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. If you forgot your pyjamas, Emirates has got you covered. Fly Emirates, fly better. Well, as I mentioned earlier on in the uh, programme, the oil price has largely shrugged off Iran's attack on Israel over the weekend. A barrel of Brent crude currently changing hands at $89.21 a barrel. That's off just shy of 1.5% on the day. Well, foreign exchange markets, well, the US dollar has today hit its highest level against a basket of currencies since November last year. But as you can see, the dollar is off right now against sterling 
Uh, I think uh, much of that is influenced by uh, the yen dollar hitting a 34-year high against the Japanese currency today. On the equity markets, well, let me show you how European stocks have finished. Only the uh, Ibex in Madrid in negative territory. I draw your attention to the DAX in Germany at the uh, top left-hand of the screen. They've gone back above 18,000, a level it first captured in February of this year. Talking points in mainland Europe today included GS, the Belgian insurer, which recently abandoned a takeover approach 